welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Um, you know, in many parts of the United States, access to re reproductive health care is scarce, sometimes even dangerous. The beautiful new film, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, from writer-director Eliza Hittman, tells the intimate story of a working-class 17-year-old girl and her cousin who traveled New York City to get the abortion she can't receive in her Pennsylvania town. It's an incredible, heartbreaking, beautiful film told in intimate detail. Please welcome its stars, Sydney Flanagan and Talia Ryder, and writer-director director Eliza Hittman. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Hi, thank you. Um, I love this film. It is, um, you just do, I said this in the green room, and I, I absolutely mean this, you do everything right. Um, it is very hard, I think, to make a movie like this, to tell a story like this, a hot-button issue, and to make it solely just about the characters and to never fall into any sort of preachy trap because those traps, while it sounds like they'd be hard to fall into, they're quite easy because narratively that's where movies always go. You feel like you have to go there in a way. So when you set out writing this movie, how did you avoid any of those moments? I imagine that also came along with how you worked with your actors in the moment as well. Um, I think in the writing process, there was a lot of fear that I had that the script would be overly didactic. Yeah. And that was, you know, a fear that I carried with me through the entire writing process. And I, I just tried to remind myself that the story I was telling, you know, it is a coming of age story. It is a road movie. It is a bureau bureaucratic odyssey. And, you know, just trying to find the poetry, I guess, in all of it, because I think you can make films that are overly, you know, political and that, you know, can talk, you know, about a current moment. But I think that, you know, if you can achieve something that is poetic and political, it has a longer lifespan in a way. But even in the road movie genre, and I, as much as this is two two nights on the on the road, really, it does in some ways feel like a you know the the one one night only movie where all everything's going to happen in one night. Even yeah. those, you yeah. can often feel like you can see all the setups and yeah. be like, okay, I know how this is going to play out, and the, the, I know how this character is going to play out in the third act. But even when you introduce someone that I know has to come back later, you bring them back in a much more subtle, interesting way and in how they relate to these two women at this at, at this moment. Is that simply just being aware of all of the cliches within these genres that you could potentially fall into? I think so. I think I have an awareness of like where the script would go too far, but I also test those boundaries and then rein things back, right. if that makes sense. Um, I, I spent a lot of time researching the film and taking the physical journey of the character. So like I hopped on the bus in rural Pennsylvania and took it all the way to Port Authority. And I just tried to write from those images and moments that I experienced along the way and then sort of expand them into the journey of the character. How did you go about casting? What was the casting process like for you? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so when I was about 14 years old, I was at a backyard wedding in South Buffalo. Um, this is yeah. the best story possible already. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Eliza's partner, Scott Cummings, had been in Buffalo for some time making a film called Buffalo Juggalos. And um, I guess Eliza was there that day at the wedding and saw me there and um her and scott had added me on facebook and i guess her and scott had like watched my videos of me over the years playing music and um they they reached out to me you know um like a few months before the film and asked me if i wanted to audition for this part and i was very confused at first because it was just so random had you acted at all before no no i i worked i worked in a grocery store and i played in bands and stuff um in like locally around my city and um it was just this extremely random opportunity and at first i was you know the, I, I was i didn't think it was something i was capable of and but after you know skyping with eliza and reading the script and seeing how like, you know, kind of amazing it was. And after my friends sort of encouraging me to give it a shot, I gave it a shot. And I, I'm really glad I did because this is such 
such an amazing story and it's also been such a transformative experience yeah you should never do it again no offense it's <laughs> never going to be this good <laughs> <laughs> yeah it certainly will be hard to top this one working yeah. with eliza was was an amazing experience how do you and if you can answer this question as well obviously like you're not a non-actor anymore you are an actress now because you're incredible in this but in the particular scene where the camera is trained on you for solid three or four minutes while you're answering a questionnaire. 11. 11 minutes, uh -huh. excuse it, me. It's cut down a little bit, but that whole take plays as a, you know, an entire can of film. I mean, that's how gripping it is that I thought it was three minutes. No, no, it? yeah. Wow. She, did it, she did it for a whole can of film. How did you, I mean, how did you get yourself to that place? How did Eliza get you to that place? How did you figure out how to act? Yeah, um, I feel like there was a lot of factors at play. Um, I, you know, because obviously I had never acted before, so it's not like I had some natural ability to just be like, all right, let's do tears right now. You know, I don't I don't know how to do that, but I just, um, I don't know, I went in, I just remember going into the room and, you know, and I was kind of right, like, just kind of like, right, this is the moment. And there was like all these cameras on me, like really close. So I already felt kind of like there vulnerable. Were two yeah. cameras, one like really pressed up yes. against her and one three quarter. So one frontal and one three quarter and she was trapped. Yes. And the social worker was a real social worker. And I felt like that really helped in the sense that it, it already felt like a very real moment. And there was like a real empathy coming from her. And I don't know, I just, I, I guess I kind of tried my best to just like look inside myself for like whatever, you know, even if it was like a memory that was out of context, like just like whatever deepest, darkest memories are kind of there and just sort of like tap into them and just allow them to trigger whatever reaction that they come about and then like mixed with the context of the scene and how real it felt talking to the counselor. It just, I don't know, everything layered together just kind of, helped create that reaction. How many takes did you do? Uh, I believe that was the first take. Yeah. And you just did one? We did one, and then Sydney said, well, that was cathartic, and I don't think I could do it again. <laughs> yeah, it felt like really amazing for some reason. Um, and then we did a couple more, but the take that's in the film is the first take. Right. And the, you know, the other ones are good, they're just different. They're a little more stoic. Right. Um, Tell you the uh, your relationship, the both of your relationship is so sometimes uh, it's it, it's without words. The two of you don't speak for uh, for extended periods of time, but yet you know exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. What was it like creating that dynamic? Do the two of you talk on set more about what the characters are actually thinking and feeling, considering they don't necessarily do that in the scene? Um, yeah, I think the key to having that kind of telepathic bond was to really understand each other as people rather than as our characters. Um, we had a really, really short rehearsal process. We had about two days to kind of get a feel for the script and for each other. Um, Eliza gave us a couple um, like bonding type exercises that we did right off the bat and it really just like... What were they? Um, one of them was she gave us each a journal and wrote three really personal prompts in them and had us write out our answers and then share them with each other and share them not with Eliza. We spent like an hour just going through these prompts, but they were really personal questions. And it just kind of like, I don't know, once you know that much about someone, it's really hard not to feel a strong connection to them. And that I feel like really just was what we needed to understand each other and understand our characters. Um. I hate to be uh, the only the lone man on the stage and talk about the role that men play in the film. Yeah. Um, but it is one uh, that filled me with um, shame and regret in the sense that none of the men in the film take a moment to recognize what may be happening with the women in their life or that, are, that they're coming across on the street, that they're talking to for a minute on the bus, or that they're, they live with. They all seem to sort of view them solely via the surface or what they want from them or may need from them. And at times it's um, trivial in a way, but maybe a microaggression, and at times it's outright mm -hmm. aggressive mm -hmm. and, 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 and damaging. Can you talk about building a world where men are threatening from the point of uh, just obliviousness and to intention? Yeah, I guess, you know, in a classical sort of 
story structure. You know, you have a pro protagonist and an antagonist, and you know, I wasn't. The antagonist was men. <laughs> yes, exactly. I was just thinking about like, was there a way to create an atmosphere? of hostility towards these young women rather than having a conventional antagonist and playing with the tension that women encounter every day in their lives and how it affects their relationship to what they do in themselves. Um, so yeah, there, there's some small moments and then there's some larger moments that women encounter, you know, this kind of toxic energy, um, but that was the goal. You know, I think the movie makes some men uncomfortable, and I think that I hope it's educational for them to understand what it's like to walk in a woman's shoes, because I think that part of coming of age as a young woman is learning how to navigate these small and large tensions that exist. Well, the young man, forgive me for not remembering the actor's name. Uh, Theodore Pellerin. The, from, from the bus, yes. who, who mm -hmm. reappears later on. Mm -hmm. um, what I love so much about that dynamic between the two of you is that it is host I mean, it becomes toxic, yet yeah. at the same time remains ambiguous. Yeah, mm -hmm. he thinks he's being charming. Yes, and at the same time, there is this is a coming yeah. of age moment for her where it's like, I don't think she necessarily wants to do this, but mm -hmm. I think she is mm -hmm. kind of experimenting with mm -hmm. her own boundaries mm -hmm. at the same time, and he is exploiting that, whether he knows that or not, it's such a fascinating dynamic and much more exploratory rather than him just being an antagonist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, from the beginning that they meet, when the opening moments where they meet him, you know, the first thing that happens is there's a gesture where he just taps her on the arm. And I told the actor, you know, you're kind of rupturing their bubble. You know, that they're traveling alone. You know, they're, they're you know, with each other in this kind of, you know, space you know, headspace, dealing with all these things. And as soon as you touch them, you're, you're rupturing their world. And do you think that, sorry, we're probably getting too mm -hmm. deep into it now in a way, but do you think that character knew that he was doing that or was, in, or was trying to do that? No, I think he thinks he's being... Charming. Yeah, yeah. charming. He's reaching out and yeah. kind of establishing a, connect, a physical connection, connection that he can then <laughs> work Yeah, out but later. no woman wants to be touched by a strange guy on the bus, regardless of, you know, how charming yeah. or handsome he may think of himself. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I wanted him, you know, to be, to sort of symbolize in a way the sort of relentlessness of like a male pursuer. You know, pursuer. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, you know, at a moment of vulnerability, you know, she reaches out and responds. But until that moment, you know, she's deflecting and deflecting and deflecting Talia's character. Can you talk about doing those scenes with, with him and, and creating that dynamic? Yeah, well, in the beginning, like Eliza said, it's a casual encounter. This isn't probably the first time she's been flirted with by a boy in a public setting. This is probably something that the two girls experience that any teen girl experiences on a regular basis, but it's not until they're in a vulnerable situation and need something from him that Skylar like actually considers the power that she has over him rather than her having rather than him having that power over her. She kind of it, it, it's like that coming of age grappling with you know that there's this constant male gaze, but it's kind of like am I going to use it or am I just going to let it be what it is? And unfortunately, the heroic moment that Skylar chooses to have is a sad one and it's something that she shouldn't have to do, but yeah. yeah. Um, Eliza, how do you, there's a, I don't think the film is in any way improvised, but your your aesthetic and your style is definitely playing off of filmmakers who over the you know, course of generations. Devise narrative. Yeah. Uh, um, what is it like uh, on your set? How much are you storyboarding? How much are you finding these close-ups in the moment? How are, you, how are you working to define and create this aesthetic? Um, I would say very little is improvised. Um, there's like one scene in a Chinese bakery towards the end of the film where they just 
candidly talk about the food that they're eating. And it's just like a, a simple moment where we're meant to feel like daily life is coming back after the crisis has ended. And I let them improvise about the food and the greasiness of the food. And, you know, it's just a That's simple... That's not their only moment in a Chinatown bakery, No, there's right? two yeah. moments in Someone a Someone uh, make, making this movie loves Chinatown bakeries, yes, I think. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, but, the you know, the dialogue wasn't s- improvised. It's very economically written and almost not realistic to the way people speak. Um, so I'm not trying to, you know, get to a kind of casual improvised dialogue. It's very stylized, I think, actually, um, with regards to how the film is shot. It has, um, you know, I think, you know, ri- uh, writing a script is a little bit like making a sculpture. So you sort of like know the shape that you're working in and the structure of it. And then for me, it's about going through it and carving subjectivity throughout mm-hmm. and details. So it's not just two, you know, scenes with two people talking to each other, that it's about you know, physical interaction and point of view. Um, so I have to make sure that's all there on the page before shooting it. And then shooting it, it's very much about, you know, the main character's subjective experience in the world. So staying close to her proximity-wise with the camera and then, um, you know, a little bit more distance to everybody else is the general strategy. And then there's a lot of, like, sort of small moments um, of physical behavior that I do closer and, uh, and just slightly off speed. Just sort of... Punk- you- are they written into the script? They or? are. Oh, okay. They're all written into the script. So, like, the pinkies moment, yeah. you know, the hand touching. They're all, like, kind of extreme close-ups, you know, that are slightly off speed. Um, and I don't know. They're, you know, I love my DP, Helen Luvar, and she has a very fluid and organic way of shooting, you know, where she's not... She knows how to, like, erase the presence of the camera person. It's not overly handheld. There's not a verite feel. No, and actually... There's a fluidity. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go, so ahead. Sorry, go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. But you're reminding me of something that I love so much about the movie, uh-huh. which is that there are... Uh, it largely feels handheld, not overly handheld, uh-huh. and, like, a... You know, we're not, like, 24, where we're whipping around or anything. No. But every now and then, in the midst of this kind of semi-static handheldness, there is a fluid shot around somebody that feels like it's suddenly... don't think it's on a dolly, necessarily. Mm -hmm. There's a mix of things. There's Steadicam, there's dolly. It's, you know, there's not one consistent choice to be handheld throughout the film. It felt like there was a... There were very... distinct, excuse me, wow, distinct moments throughout the movie where you decided to sort of um, fluidly or very smoothly kind of wrap around Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. Sydney while she was experiencing something or taking something. Oh, the like sonogram? Yeah, the sonogram Mm -hmm. moments. Yeah, there's a few moments. That's a steady cam. Yeah. Uh Um, We brought a, you know, steady cam into a small operating room and how to add some ideas of sort of subjective movements. Yeah. Like she looks at the sonogram and sort of turns her head away in protest. Mm-hmm. And then that's the steady cam. There's, a, there's actually a steady cam operator standing on top of her um, at that moment. <laughs> on this, Sydney was in a lot of uncomfortable situations in the filming of the movie. Um, and she was very patient with us while we tried to get these movements right. But yeah, just and then there's one that happens outside Planned Parenthood where the camera kind of arcs around her. Um, Yeah, you know, just it's all about for me, you know, taking a scene that could otherwise be, you know, very straightforward and trying to really put the audience through the experience of the character and make sure that we understand and punctuate what she's thinking and feeling. What was it like for the two of you? You had two days. And was there any rehearsal period? Because oftentimes with, you know, uh, you are not non-actors anymore, but not having necessarily been in a lot prior to this, you know, a lot of filmmakers uh, who make movies like this sometimes have weeks-long rehearsal periods where they almost, like, shoot the entire movie on something else and then go film it. Did you have anything like that to get comfortable with the material? No, like, we had two days in an apartment, and we pretty much, I mean, there was... The like little bonding exercises that we did that Talia talked about earlier, and then besides that, it was kind of like we just kind of like looked through the script and kind of like 
loosely kind of like you know staged a couple little scenes and you know like in the living room and it was just um it was I don't know it was like it was kind of like we skimmed it and then we just jumped in. Sydney practiced her songs too she would like play guitar for me and Eliza and and then we had some like intimacy exercises where I had Talia put makeup on Sydney (laughs) and we rehearsed scenes while they were just doing each other's makeup to try and establish the tone you know, of the performances that we were looking for. Was that scene, did you get that scene from that moment with them, or was that already in the It was already in the script, Um, but I just used it as an exercise, an activity to bring them together, have them touch each other, and establish, you know, the, the sort of type of performance I was looking for. How did you know that they would, and please do not take offense to this in any way, but how did you know that like on the day of shooting that they would be prepared to be able to do these scenes? If I mean, just in terms of uh-huh. memorizing the lines, knowing how to step in. I, uh-huh. I, you know, I think of something like Chop Shop where Ramin uh-huh. Barani shot the entire film on a handheld camera uh-huh. with his non-actor and then went and made the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think... Um, Sorry, can you ask one more time? I was just thinking about Ramin Barani for a second. You distracted me. I had a moment of trauma. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. Um, Fair. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about how did you know that... Um, they would be... Well, one thing yeah. that was interesting was when, when I started auditioning Sydney, she had never acted before, and I handed her a script, and I watched her stare at the page and then put it down. And I never, ever, ever, in the kind of day that we spent auditioning her, saw her struggle to remember a line. She just read the scene and internalized it. Mm. So I don't think that I was ever concerned about memorization of lines, and it's not a talky script. Um, Mm -hmm. I do think, you know, I was anxious about not having... I think that actually the bigger challenge wasn't them. It was you know, sort of working with day players who showed up for sort of important scenes who I didn't have time to prepare with. They were, they were sort of easy and, um, you you know, like your mom and dad, like not mom and dad, like some, some other people in clinics and there's scenes that got cut, I would say, because, um, I didn't have time to really work with like a nurse who showed up and had to memorize a, a lengthy scene to, to act with Sydney. Can you talk about the casting of the, of the mom and dad too? Yeah. Probably the only familiar faces uh, in, the, in the film. Yeah. Um, I, we, we, it was unclear like while we were putting the film together whether I would be able to shoot you know, the first part of the film really in Pennsylvania. And initially I thought I would cast locally. You know, so we'd be shooting like you know, two weeks in Pennsylvania and two weeks in New York. And then it ended up only being a few days and we shot and cheated a lot of interiors in New York, Mm. which wasn't, you know, ideal for me because I'm somebody who like needs, you know, authenticity. And I just started thinking about, you know, okay, if we're not casting locally, like who do I like? You know, and I had just seen Black Klansman and I was really smitten with Ryan Eggold in it. He's a very nice man. (laughs) He's such a nice man, yeah. Um, and so I just watched Klansman and I said, let's cast that, let's cast him. Um, and then Sharon, I was listening to her music a lot while writing and it was just, you know, sort of, I don't know, in my, in my mind and in my creative space as I was working on the film. Um, Did Ryan have any issues with, um, playing a character who, uh, no, no, he didn't have, you know, he didn't have any issues being an unlikable character. Extremely unlikable. Yeah. I think he, you know, he's such a, he's such an actor and such a good actor. He really wanted more to do. And I feel badly, (laughs) you know, he always had suggestions for how to expand. And I was like, I'm sorry. I just don't have time in, you know, the first 20 minutes of this movie to expand the role. In a way, but I would like to obviously do something else with him because I think he's incredible. The choices that you made with his character are so specific and so articulate and so, at the same time, um, not vague. vague. Mm-hmm. They elicit a, a, like a big idea about who he is or mm-hmm. who, he, who he may be. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about writing those scenes? I mean, specifically his gaslighting of her when he says it's all in her head Mm -hmm. or the moment with the dog Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. uh, the language that he's using is one particular to that type of person, no matter what his actual misdeeds may be. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I don't know. I just wanted like really a suggestion of his inappropriateness and a feeling. There's subtle things that I wanted. I wanted him to feel, well, I wanted the audience to feel that he's sort of resentful of her having talent and ambition. And you sort of feel that at the beginning where he refuses to compliment her, you know, and tell her she's good at what she does. And, you know, just a subtle feeling that he's like kind of another baby in the house. She gets him dressed. Sharon's character gets him dressed in the morning, you know, and then he has this inappropriate moment, um, which is a small moment, but it really resonates to people where he sexualizes a dog. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, for me, the film, it's not a family drama. It's his version of playfulness, but at the same time, it's, it's wildly inappropriate yes, playfulness in front of a line. family. Yeah. I, I pulled those moments from real life, you know, and they were easy. Yeah, they're easy <laughs> to sort of, but you know. Um, I grew up around men like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he's a type, yeah. for sure. Um, and I think, you know, there was obviously room to, you know, elevate and tone down in the edit and just, it was, you know, a challenge to try and find the right level of unlikable yeah, the, stepdad. The toning down of it is so beautiful with the dog as well, because there are moments where you're not exactly sure if you heard him say what mm -hmm, he mm -hmm, said, mm -hmm. like it's there, but mm -hmm. did I just hear that? And then he says it again and you're like, oh yeah, he's, he's going mm -hmm, for it. Mm -hmm. He's a scumbag. Mm -hmm. Um... Look, uh, I, I have to let you go. I love the film so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Your performances are so beautiful. Um, it comes out, does it come out this Friday? Is it this Friday? Correct. This Friday in yeah. theaters? I think, yeah. I'm confused between the opening and the actual release day, but yes, I think Friday. It's called Never Rarely, Sometimes Always. It comes out this Friday. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs>